Good afternoon, everyone. As you can see, I'm delighted to be joined on stage by Matteo Flamini, who you might know from his deep misfortune of having spent seven years at Arsenal, as well as, of course, being a three-time FA Cup winner a, and a Serie A winner with AC Milan. He's, of course, here in his capacity as the CEO of GF Biochemicals, uh, biochemical company that he started while he was still a player. We will dig into that in some detail a little bit later. But one thing I'm keen to start with, perhaps, is your experience as a player sort of with money. You know, by the time you get to your late teens, you can be earning you know, sizable wedges of cash. What sort of guidance do you get, either from the club or maybe your agent, manager, on how to deal with that capital? So first of all, good afternoon, everybody. Very pleased to be here. And uh, maybe to answer your question, a straightforward answer is like, we didn't get or we are not getting any advice at all. So if we go back a little bit in time, I remember, uh, so I started my career, I was 18. Started for the club of Marseille and very quickly I moved to UK uh, to, to join the club of Arsenal. And uh, I remember being, uh, being 19, 18 and a half, 19. I don't think at the age I've even like set up a bank account. Okay, and um, I remember someone from the club taking me to the local bank. At the time, I was living in Hampstead and opening up a, a bank account. I, I didn't have any clue what was at the time uh, interest, mortgage, and uh, um, simply opened a bank account in the local bank. And already at the time, I was 19, and we were making a, a serious amount of money. So um, is that normal? I don't think so. I think uh, there should be some, some kind of organization or maybe clubs or institutions such as the Premier League and others should support the athlete because the reality is um, if you're not supported by the club, if you're not supported by, by the Premier League or by the largest organization, I mean, then you have to rely on uh, maybe your family or your agent. And uh, if you're well surrounded, this is great. I've been lucky because I was well surrounded. But if you're not like necessarily well surrounded, then you can have some, some trouble. Presumably, you do start to get you know, inbound requests. Oh, you should invest in this, invest in that. How does that happen? And do, does it come through your agent? Or do people just reach you by other means? I would say this is pretty organic. Usually, it comes from, uh, yes, your agent, your surrounding, people you meet. Uh, circumstances in life make you uh, sometimes meet uh, people and then you know you have a certain uh, affinity and uh, you, develop, uh, you can develop a business or you can make some investment. The reality is when you're an athlete, first, you don't have too much time to, to play around and to, to go around, I would say. And two, usually what you do is like you, you stay in your bubble, OK, because you're playing every three days. And uh, most of the time, I mean, everybody, people want a lot from you. So you stay in your bubble. And the, the, the few contacts you, uh, you have with the outside world is through your, your agent, through your friend, and maybe your family. So most of the investment opportunity you have, they come from those, uh, those, those entities. So again, what I was saying is like if you're well surrounded and you have people who do the job properly, then you can be successful. But if you're not, then uh, you, you, can be, you can be exposed and you can make the wrong investment and you can, you can have a lot of trouble. Is it something you talk about with other players? You know, exchange ideas, what do you... I mean, I assume so because you have an investment with Mesut Erdzil. Um, you know, what sort of conversations are they like in the cafeteria, perhaps? We do. We do, of course. We're trying to understand a little bit from one to another, I mean, what we're doing. But uh, the reality is when you're an athlete, uh, you quit school at maybe the age of 16, 17. If you're lucky, 18, maybe you, you, you do your level. I was lucky. I, I studied law. I could miss 75% uh, 75 of the classes. But I remember at the time asking my first club, Olympic of Marseille, if I could miss 75, uh, if I could miss 25% of the training to go to university. But quickly they told me, I mean, like uh, you need to, you're being paid to play football, not to study. So the reality is, like, not all the athletes have the, uh, the, I would say, the knowledge of the education to understand a little bit also how to make investment. I remember also asking uh, a friend of mine in the dressing room, how much do you pay your agent? Usually an agent can be like between 10, 15, 20 percent. I remember him telling me this, and I tell him how much. I would like to win, and he take care of uh, his own commission. So all this is pretty, like um, I will say, immature. But this is something you can expect when you have to quit school at the age of 16 to basically be fully committed in a sport uh, in a sport you love so much. You said so. You said you did. You do then presumably the first year of university in Marseille before coming to London for law. When do you really start thinking? I mean, the classic route for a footballer, at least in the UK, was you retire, you buy a pub. Uh, Alex Ferguson, I think, was being taught how to run a pub by Gordon Strachan's dad or something. 
before he became manager of Aberdeen. When do you start really thinking about, you know, it's quite a short career, what you're going to be doing at the end of it? <clears throat> so first of all, um, I grew up by the sea. Okay, my dad used to be a diver and I remember those uh, unlimited, I mean like those uh, long time spending on a beach collecting plastic. So from a very early age, I was very much aware of the of the issue related to sustainability, climate change, and the impact we could have, the negative impact we could have on nature. So for me, it was, um, it became a passion. It has been a journey, of course. So my biggest passion was football, and I've been extremely lucky to, to live a dream. And uh, the second passion was sustainability. So from very early age, at the age of 25, when I moved from Arsenal to AC Milan, I had the opportunity to meet with, to meet with some scientists. At the time, they were uh, ex, uh, ex BASF scientists. They were also working with the Polytechnic of Milan. And again, as I was saying, you know, circumstances. I met with uh, uh, the other co founder, I met with those, those scientists, and we decided to start a, a journey. And the journey was to very much um, join the effort to accelerate the transition from the petrochemical industry, meaning like the chemical product based on oil, to transition to a biochemical industry, which means starting from biomass. And, uh, this has been a long journey because uh, they have forgot to tell me that bringing a new molecule to the market, uh, it's a journey of 10 years. If they, are, if they would have told me, maybe I would have never started it. But uh, it's been uh, pretty interesting, I would say. And yes, you know, we speak between the athletes about investment, and uh, everybody is looking for answers. And it's not always easy for them to, to find those answers. So your, your um, co-founder, Pascale Granata, how did you, how did you meet him, actually? So we meet. I should say he's the, it's GF Biochemicals. Pascale Granata is the G, and Mathieu is the F. Yes. So I, I, I prefer when we say that we are entrepreneurs more than investors because we started the business and uh, uh, we met through friends. We met through friends, and uh, like I was saying before, uh, when you're an athlete and uh, you play in a big clubs, you know you are in, in a bubble, and uh, it's usually you know you, you don't go out of that bubble very often because you're very busy with 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 the training and you're playing every three days and we met through through common friends and uh, we had the same vision the same the same i would say passion for sustainability and we decided together to to build this company so it's been an exciting journey not always easy uh, because um, when you're an entrepreneur every day you have good reason to to stop and 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 to move on to something different. But I think with a, with a bit of determination, you can be successful. Can you talk me through what your day looked like when you were training, but also an entrepreneur on the side? Like, it, say you don't have a match, it's not a match day, but typical Tuesday or Thursday or something. How does that day look for you? So um, let's say you start the training, you meet generally around 9 o'clock. Um, then you, you get out on a pitch around 10. And then you have like two hours training outside, so it's very intense focusing on uh, intensity and speed. And then you, you come back and usually you have a gym and, uh, and probably some massage or, or some stretching. So as a, as a football player, you can be home, you, you back home around like 2.30, 2.30 later, 3 o'clock. So you still have enough time to challenge yourself, to focus on a, a different passion, to focus on a, on, on a different subject. And, and for me, it has been a bit of an escape. Because when you're an athlete, and probably like, like you guys in your work, you have some up, you have some down, and when you go back home, I mean, the last thing you want to do is to bring your problem home. So um, when I was playing, sometimes you were injured, sometimes you were not playing. So it was for me an escape. It was helping me to first change my mind and to challenge myself also intellectually. Does it, I mean, at that stage, I assume, I don't want to make too many assumptions, they come to you because they're like, well, he has capital, right? He can help invest in this. Did they kind of get more than they bargained for? I mean, first, this is true. I was uh, investing the money I was making on a speech, on a pitch. I was investing it in that, in that, in that venture. But I think at the end, it's, uh, it's about like complementary. It's like um, in a team, everybody can bring different skills. So um, yes, I had some capital to invest. I hope I also brought different skills and just money. But um, as I was saying, I think everybody has different skills. And it's about like building a complementary team. It's like uh, you know, in a football team, when you have uh, 11 players, if you put like 11 strikers, I mean, I can guarantee you will not win the game. Are you talking about Brazil here or no? Different team. Um, <laughs> can we? Uh, Maybe just explain what is levulinic acid. That is your main product. What is it? What does it do? What are its applications? So maybe let me tell you a little bit about the, the petrochemical industry. So today, the petrochemical industry is everywhere. Everything you touch, everything you use, when, when, whatever you're, you're sitting right now. 
so we cannot escape from the petrochemical industry. Okay? This industry is generating one third of the oil demand. Okay, and by 2050, we generate more, it will be generate more oil demand than transportation. Okay? So we're going through a transition, going from a petrochemical industry to a bio-based industry. And two main factors, the first one is a regulator, which is phasing out all those harmful chemicals from the consumer goods. And two are people like you, people like me, which are requesting safer and more sustainable uh, product. Okay, going from shampoo to deodorant to paint, shower gel. And basically what we are doing, we have developed a molecule platform, okay, which allowed us to do derivatives and to man manufacture what we call plant-based solvent. Those plant-based solvent are being found in shampoo, deodorant, shower gel, you know, when you turn the packaging and you see at the back the 20 to 30 like ingredients which you never understand. I mean, we are one of them. And what we do is basically we replace the harmful ingredient coming from the petrochemical industry and making the end product much more sustainable and much more like safer for people. So what are the, what, what goes into it? And then ultimately further down the line, what are the kind of end products you are in? Shampoo one? So we start from uh, agriculture waste. So what's important to mention is what we call second generation feedstock, which means there is no competition with the food industry. We take this feedstock, it can be like leftover from the sugar cane, leftover from the corn cobs, and we convert that via a chemical reaction, we convert that into what we call plant-based solvent. And those plant-based solvent are being used in shampoo, in shower gel, in paints. Maybe I'll give you a, a few examples. Is, is there a brand that I might use that you supply? Um, maybe, <laughs> because we work with a big FMCG company. Can you name one or two? Or? I'm not allowed, okay. because usually when they find a good technology, they try to keep it very, very quiet. But maybe a few examples. I'm sure we all use shampoo, okay? And we have all heard about like silicon. So the silicone is being found in shampoo, is being found in, in, in a shower gel, is being found in a cream you put on your skin. So it's a, what we call a petrochemical product come from the industry of, of oil. And it is not biodegradable, meaning every time you use a shampoo which has silicone in it, the silicone is going through the drain and is accumulating in a water, meaning that maybe at one point you may gonna find it in a water we drink. So it's being phased out from the market 2024, 2025. So our product, our replacement, of the silicone, but our product, the main difference is they are 100% biodegradable, meaning when you use them, they degrade in nature instead of contaminating. And uh, what has been very interesting is like lately, the US uh, government has banned what we call the for forever chemicals, which means chemicals which never degrade. So they have banned six of them, and hopefully this is gonna create a momentum, and we will have more and more chemicals being phased out from, from the market. It's interesting because you sort of had two fields you had to learn about. There's the kind of the business piece, but then also this sort of biochemical, you know, biochemistry, essentially. How, I mean, you had these perhaps five, six, seven hours at the end of your day after training. How did you set about, you know, immersing yourself in learning this stuff? I mean, first of all, I've been a never-ending student for the past, I would say, 12 years. I'm surrounding of PhDs, I'm surrounding by engineers, technicians, and I have, don't have any technical background at all. As I was saying, I studied law for, for six months. I think um, for me, the definition of intelligence is one, adaptability, being able to adapt, and two, the capability to learn. And uh, I didn't have the choice, I had to learn, and I had to learn quickly, because uh, I became um, the CEO of the company uh, a year ago, following the investment from, from Sofinova. And, and Sparta, which are two of the very, uh, I would say, um, sophisticated investors in a biotech field. And the last aspect is I've also been able to leverage some of the learnings which I've, uh, which I've accomplished during my, my life of uh, football players. And those learnings have been transferred in my life of an entrepreneur. And if you want, I can mention you a few of them. Sure, go for it. I mean, first of all, is perform under pressure. When you play in front of 80,000 people and many more uh, on TV, not only you have to deal with the pressure, but you have to be good at what you do. And when you're an entrepreneur, this is the same. I was investing my own money for many, many years, and uh, I didn't have other choice than to make it successful. This is the first aspect. The second aspect is dedication, hard work. Um, when you play at the highest level, it's a 200% ded dedication. Same when you're an entrepreneur. I mean, like work day, night, and um, you have to keep going. As I was saying before, every day you have many reasons to stop but you have to keep going because it's, it's hard work. And I would say the, the last part is probably like team spirit, teamwork, leadership. When you're on a pitch, I mean, you're part of a team of 11 players. You cannot play on, on your own, and you have to put as a priority the team 
before yourself. I think this is exactly the same when you are in a company. I think the company comes first. And uh, even if people make the company, this is important to, to work as a team and to inspire others, I think. You mentioned you had this Series A last year. You raised 15 million euros from a few um, venture firms. Clearly, when they actually decide to invest, it's real money. They've got to make the right decisions. But you being you, does it help open some doors? So, of, of course, I have to be honest. Uh, when you're a top athlete, uh, it's easier to, to meet people, the people you really want to meet. This is one aspect. But also, it can create, uh, uh, it can have a negative, uh, negative effect at the same time. Because being an ex-football player and, uh, and running a biotech company um, is not always easy. So we are not building an app or we're not building like a, a website. We are in deep tech, meaning like hard capex, building a chemical plant, we're manufacturing in Asia. So um, when, I, when I was uh, in discussion with Sofinova, which is, I would say, in Europe, one of the most sophisticated investors in, in deep tech, um, being obviously like an ex-football player was not, I will say, uh, always easy to justify. And even when we had the discussion about like if I was going to run the company or not, I had to, uh, I always believed I had to work harder than the others to justify my position, I would say. And then we went through like a, a long process. I think it, it, it took like maybe between, uh, maybe between eight to 12 months in order to, to close this round because I had to go through like a, a full audit of the companies. And um, for the small stories, they even organized a call with Arsene Wenger to make a due diligence on myself and check if I was like reliable, hardworking guy. So um, they probably checked a little bit of everything so before. You, you to gave them a little bit of equity, them. and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know how to do that. Thank God, <laughs> he's got plenty of money. Um, the the way that uh, you know your sort of post career now, there are a lot of players, presumably, particularly when you were a youth player, who you know, weren't as good as you, or at least didn't have your success. What sort of things are they doing? You know, is it perhaps you know, players who were in you know League Two, Championship, or, or a little bit lower, earning decent money but not incredible money? How how is that path for them? Like, do they have to think even more carefully about their money, and is it harder? <clears throat> I think it's the same problem for for every athlete. At the end of the day, of course, if you make more money, I mean, it can be easier to to address your after career, but. Uh, Let's not forget that when you play, uh, when you're an athlete, I mean, it's, it's, it's a short period of time. We talk about like 10, 15, 16, 17 years, you know, if you're lucky. I think I've played like 17, 18 years. But um, the hardest part is how to reinvent yourself. You know, imagine like you're a journalist, you have been doing that all your life, and from one day to another, we tell you you cannot do it anymore. You have to find something else to do. So, you know, this transition is not always easy because you have to first to reinvent yourself and two, I mean, mentally, it's not, uh, it's not uh, always easy to find something else which you have something else to do which you have never done. This is why, I mean, most of the athletes, I will say, usually stay in, in, in a world of, of, of football. They become agents, they become managers, they become like, uh, they work on TV because uh, it, it, it's challenging. It's challenging for someone to reinvent himself and, and find himself like a new purpose, a new mission, and to, to learn everything from scratch. Actually, that fundraise last year, can you talk a bit about the valuation? Was it tens of millions, hundreds of millions, higher, lower? I mean, we're a private company, so... Which is why I asked the question, <laughs> otherwise I'd be able to see it on a stock market. <laughs> can you give a sense of the ballpark? I mean, let's say we have invested like tens of millions over the past, uh, over the past decade. Uh, business is going well. We're having like agreement with large chemical company, large FMCG company. We're launching a new uh, R&D facility in uh, Aix-en-Provence, in the south of France, which will very much focus on bringing the new product to the market, trying to, again, bring solutions to a problem. I mean, we all use consumer goods, and the idea is like to make them safer and more sustainable. So things are going well. And I'm also working closely with the French government because we have the intention to uh, develop, um, I would say, like a new facility, potentially in Europe. And, and France is, is one of the, uh, the countries which we're exploring. It's a great ecosystem right now. One of the reasons I asked the question is I live in North London. Plenty of Arsenal fans will say, oh, Mathieu Flamini is the richest post-retired athlete, richer than Jordan, richer than any of these guys. Do you think you are or do you think you will be? I don't think I am and uh, I don't think this is a priority right now. I mean, unfortunately, uh, sometimes in, in, in football, not all the journalists, I will say, have the 
the capability to understand like the business world. So sometimes when you don't take an interview, I mean like it's difficult to control what is being written. But I'm pleased and today I'm I'm sitting with journalists very knowledgeable and we understand the business world. I think so. there's somewhere in this room, if not on this stage. <laughs> um, my very final question. Prospects, Arsenal this season, are they going to do it? <laughs> <laughs> this is a very good question. And uh, since I am a, an Arsenal fan, obviously I believe, I think they have brought back hope with the Arsenal fan. We're all very proud again to be an Arsenal fan. And, uh, and I want to believe that it is possible. I mean, so far we have been doing the, the right things. And uh, we know um, to win the Premier League this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. We know we have uh, another couple of games ahead of us. We have to stay focused and, and make sure we cross the line uh, first. Well, thank you so much, Mathieu, for joining us. Quick hands, hands together for him, Mathieu, Mr. Flamini. Thank you very much. Thank you.